Hello everyone, I am Fozzy, or Cam, and welcome to the Everything Podcast. I'm here, as always, usually always, unless he has something to do with my co-host, Will. How you doing today, Will? I'm doing spectacular, Cam. I'll be honest, I haven't been this excited to to do a podcast, uh, or this is as excited I've been to do a pod, this is as excited as I've been for any podcast in all the pods that we've done, uh... Here. Even more than Multiverse of Madness or No Way Home? Uh, p- potentially, yes, because I, I just can't think of a time I have more things to say than now. But simply put, I'm doing great. And how are you doing, Cam? I'm doing fantastic. And today we have Mike with us to discuss Thor, Love, and Thunder. Yeah, thanks <laughs> for welcoming me on, having me on the show again, guys. Always a privilege and an honor to be here. Well, it's always an honor to have you on. So, usually when a big movie, like, well, a Marvel movie comes out, um, we like to celebrate by doing an entire episode on it, um, because we enjoy it, you know, and I, uh, we're actually watching Stranger Things right now, um, we're a little late to the party on that one, but I'm really enjoying it, and Will, I know you're enjoying it, so. I think it's phenomenal, Cam. Just riveting and exceptionally done is my opinion. Yeah, so we'll be able to talk about that soon, and I believe they're only doing one more season, so we're kind yep. of just in, we're just in time. Yes, uh, it's been confirmed that season five will be the final season. Will and I just wrapped up uh, season one earlier today. I can't. It'd be hard to imagine a better first season of a show. I mean, oh, we with, yeah. we we were gripped and hooked. I I think Will would agree for. The entire first season, it was just uh, compelling, entertaining, so many things happening um, on so many different levels. So, yeah, once we get uh, to a point where we're going to talk about Stranger Things, maybe I can be a guest on that episode as well. That would be great. And, um, Mike, I remember after the first episode of Stranger Things that we watched maybe a week or two ago, you turned to me and asked me, what were your thoughts? And I said, I thought that was really compelling i thought that was the impressive thing about the debut episode and it kept just being kim 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 compelling for the rest of all of season one so that's season one of stranger things is up there for the for the best seasons of uh shows that i've seen in my entire life and i don't just throw that lightly out there i thought it was fantastic yeah and i like it because there aren't a lot of episodes but they are they are longer episodes but you could kind of get through it relatively quickly. Like, you guys finish season one in a week, right? A week or two, I would say. Yeah, I mean, you can't you can't do that with some shows. Some shows, like, some shows, shows are, like, really heavy sometimes, and there are a lot of episodes. Um, so, yeah, it, it's pretty nice that we don't have so many episodes. Although, in season four, there is, a like, a two-hour episode, which is crazy. Whoa! That's like a movie that is unbel that is that's amazing do you know if it if it's the final episode of that season because that would that would that would be fast that would be fascinating if they dropped a two-hour a two-hour episode like in the middle of the season wow yeah it was the finale okay that makes sense well then i can't wait i bet that'll be my fit i bet i think that could be my favorite episode of the show then if it's two if it's two if it's two if it's two hours and and it's great. Well, I don't think I've ever heard of a two-hour episode of a show. That is, yes. wow. Credit to you, uh, Stranger Things, for uh, doing that. Wow, a two-hour episode. That's the first time that I've heard that. Yeah. All right. So um, why don't we get started on Through Love and Thunder? Because, well, we have a lot to say, to be honest with you. I mean, uh, so first I'd like to start off with our general thoughts, our our brief thoughts, our kind of review kind of not and just so you know i'll be doing a um only movie show episode on this so yeah check that out so um yeah our, our general thoughts kind of what we thought what what, what what we would change in the movie the, the the bad things about it the good things about it and all of that so um yeah one of the things i thought in this movie was i thought the comedy was fine i mean People on are, are everywhere are just complaining that there was too much comedy. And I think we all knew it was going to be a comedy movie, so I don't know why we're all so shocked that 
it 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 was funny and pe- maybe the jokes didn't land for some people i most of the time laughed at most of the jokes although that split at the um opening fight scene that that was ridiculous that that's not acceptable i i didn't like that but um uh oh by the way i'd like to issue a spoiler warning so spo- if you don't want to get spoiled cake okay, i'd recommend you watch the movie and come back um so i thought the comedy worked for me i don't think it undercut any dramatic scenes actually i still felt the impact of most dramatic scenes so wasn't a problem for me uh but i will i think you'll disagree yeah sadly i do and well all this kind of yeah like you i'll just give with just my overall takes i thought this movie i'm gonna start with what i really liked about it and that is that i thought it had a riveting beginning just the opening scene with with gore there and his daughter dying i found that an absolute just riveting opening so credit to love and thunder for that and also just the ending with for becoming you know basically a father and i have some stuff i'd like to say about that yeah, you actually texted me, texted me that you had some issues with the ending, so I look forward to hearing your takes on that. But um, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it really tapped into an emotional side there. But in between, so I thought the beginning was riveting and the ending was riveting. But in between, I had issues with pacing, too much comedy, um, which is opposite to you, Cam, and character d- development. Um. I felt like they could have gone deeper into the shock of foreseeing Jane again after, you know, eight years and her becoming Mighty Thor. I felt like they could have um, dived into just the shock of her becoming Mighty Thor more. I thought... um, Actually, uh, sorry sorry to interrupt you. No, you're fine. They did actually shoot... um, a scene where it actually completely showed her becoming the Mighty Thor. And there are actually quite a few scenes they cut out. And I heard it was a much longer movie. But um, Marvel well, had them cut some Yeah, stuff I mean, out. like, I did read that Taika Waititi said that, like, director's car- cuts aren't good. And that, like, they aren't good in this film. But I, I personally would have either, you know, extended some some scenes or, you know, added in some more scenes with stuff like that. And developing for instance like i thought valkyrie and jane's relationship could have been developed i i totally agree with that i actually have that on my notes here yeah Um, it could have used an extra 20 25 minutes maybe i completely agree and then i felt like not at the beginning and not at the end but in the middle i felt like well and i and i also mentioned pace i thought the the pace was too fast just going from one thing to another i was fine with that I felt like, like you know, certain scenes were overtaken with comedy. There's the scene where the you know kid tells Thor um, that it's nice to meet his hero, and I felt like that could have been such a you know powerful scene. But Thor, I believe he just shrugs it off, shrugs it off with like a thanks, mate. So I I felt like some things were overtaken with comedy. Um, I felt like. The pacing was too fast, and I would have improved on some character development. Um, so that's why, even though I thought that the beginning and ending were great, I struggled with kind of the middle part of the movie. But I'll stop for now and let Mike go. Yeah, thanks. Very uh, insightful observations from both of you. That's why you have what I've re- read recently within the um 12 to 25 year old age range. I believe the Everything Podcast is currently third uh, in the United States. Uh, I do want to cite, you know, because although there are some mixed reviews coming out from uh, on this film and looking at what the Google users had, 82% liked the film. IMDb was gave it a seven out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes was lower than Multiverse of Madness. Rotten Tomatoes was 67% and CinemaScope had it at B plus, but up to them um, yesterday, it has taken in $315 million uh, worldwide. And it makes it a fairly strong hit within um, the MCU and then particularly strong um, showing during the pandemic. 
here's here's my take on things. First of all, I believe um, Fozzie, we were in contact uh, before and after the movie. We all saw it about 24 hours apart from each other. In, and you gave it, I believe, initially an 8.5 out of 10. Is that and still I, where you're standing on? It sure is. I mean, I I like this movie. And the fact that it doesn't have great reviews, but it's making a lot of money, shows that, in my mind, that that's kind of exactly what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to be a big summer blockbuster that families could go see together, uh, friends could go see together and enjoy. It may not be the best movie of all time. It's a fun, entertaining summer blockbuster. So here's where I came down, and I gave it an 8.5 myself uh, coming out of the film, and I'm still standing on that. I really see it, the film in so many ways, is like going to an amusement park. It's a visual amusement park, scene by scene. Uh, One time you're on a roller coaster, you know, another time you're on the Ferris wheel, and depending where it's at, you know, it's a thrill ride. But I think uh, to Will's point, some folks that might land as inconsistency in tone. And I do believe that there can be some of that, especially with that stark, stark opening um, that you had, which couldn't be more dramatic. And then with the evolving ping, another spoiler alert with Jane and her and cancer and the plot line then as it escalates uh, towards the last third of the movie between her and Thor, very dramatic. But um, taking in its toll, just if I'm gonna look at a broad thing, I agree, Cam, it's a, it's a summer movie. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to be engaging. I do think also it's, a, um, and Will and I have talked about this, that it's, I think it's a bit of a victim of the success of Ragnarok. And if Ragnarok had never happened, I think people would see this film differently. I agree. It's such a Waika YTT movie. And there was so much happening there that had his thumbprint and handprints all over it. And um, I don't think it, it's rates as high and it, it's just not as cohesive and tight as Ragnarok. But I think in some ways that was its intent. It was going big. It was going to be colorful. It was going to carry a vast emotional range. And uh, there was a writer, uh, Nick Allen, who writes for uh, rogerebert.com. Um, Roger Ebert, one of my favorite all-time film reviewers. May he rest in peace. Yes, thank you, Will. But Nick Allen said, this entertaining sequel is still a force for good with enough visual ambition and heart in front of and behind the camera to stand on its own. And that resonated for me. I mean, that's a good point, Mike, about it being a victim to Ragnarok. But like the difference for me is like when we, Mike, rewatched Ragnarok uh, the night before we went and saw Love and Thunder. And I think my difference between Ragnarok and Love and Thunder is that in Ragnarok, I wouldn't have changed any other comedy. I thought it was perfectly used. I thought it was used all in the right spots. Whereas in this film, it's not like you, um, I'm, asking that, I'm asking them to have no comedy at all. But I thought um, in this film, they used it in places. I think we might have some connectivity issues happening, Fozzie, with Will Coughlin right now. Oh, good. We'll, we'll wait. Uh, but in the meantime, I, I just want to say that I, I don't, I don't, I, I said it before. I don't get why people don't, it, it was a comedy. It was advertised as a comedy in the trailer. So I don't know why people are shocked by that. I'm not quite sure why people are shocked. I feel like it's just, it, it is a comedy movie and I'm fine with that. I just want to check in with Will to see if he's there before I jump in. Will, are you back with us? I think we're still connected. Here's what I'd like to say about the trailer, um, Fuzzy, is, you know, the original trailer that came out really talked about this being Thor's journey and quest for inner peace and finding out who he was. And I don't think the film was true to how that trailer was portrayed in the beginning. I don't think that's the movie that I saw. I would have loved more of that quest for inner peace. So I think it set up a false expectation. And then you're coming in and you're ready for that storyline. And that storyline's not there. I actually thought the second and third trailers were truer towards that uh, the comedy that you're talking about and, and the fun. But it set it up as something different. So... 
I was kind of like, where is this inner journey that they're talking about for Thor? I really wasn't following that thread. I, I see that, but I don't know. I, um, I'd like to go a little more into um, a, a few more um, general thoughts I had on the movie here. Um, the Guardians. <laughs> That's another thing that was advertised in the trailers, and they weren't really in the movie. Um, so I, I was a little bit disappointed. Also, Will, maybe you should try to leave and come back. Maybe that'll yeah. help. I don't know. Yeah. Actually, oh, Will, yeah. are you there? Yeah, oh. I'm going to... Mike, I'm actually going to come and join you. I think the internet connection will be better there. So I'll be right back, guys. Fantastic. You know, Fozzie, so much a mirror of real life happening. Sometimes SHIT happens and you have to stand up and you have to adapt on the fly. I think Thor has to do that many times throughout the story. Was on display, you know, in all of the four films and the adventure films, and will be on display here too on the Everything Podcast. Yeah, way to persevere, Will. That was quite annoying, actually. All uh-huh. your difficulties are annoying. Um, but we were just talking about the Guardians, um, and I was saying I kind of wish they were in it more. Um, I think you'll agree with me there. I think a lot of people were disappointed by that. Yeah, I mean, I would say, like, I would have loved Cam to see more Guardians of the Galaxy as well. I felt like adventures between Thor and the Guardians were really, like, teased at the end of Endgame, but we didn't actually get to really see that come through. But I think at the end of the day, just with the story of this movie, it would have made it where there wasn't really room to have the guardians in it for longer than they did so even if that was dis- disappointing to me i think um they're just not being enough room for them in the story is why you didn't see them in the film uh more than they were shown yeah there, uh-huh. there are times i'm not sure if they knew what they wanted the movie to be you know so there was the guardians of the galaxy plot there's the gore his whole subtext plot there's the there's the drama between jane and her cancer there's the romantic comedy element and and yet interestingly enough despite all those things i'm still coming back to giving it a positive review uh it's it's a it's a it's a failed very good summer blockbuster to me i can see that yeah and once again that's what it is a summer blockbuster Get delivered on that. All right, so I'm going to breeze by a few quick um, things I, ri- I uh, wrote down. Um, it was cool to have Korg narrate the movie. He's hilarious. And I wish he was in the movie more, but because after, spoiler, again, just in case you guys haven't left yet, um, um, Korg kind of dies in the movie where he gets his, his face separated from his body. Super funny scene. Uh, but I think they kind of took him out of the movie after that, and I think that's because Taika Waititi also has to direct the movie. <laughs> so it might be kind of tough to completely, like, because he's in a motion capture suit saying all his lines, uh, so he actually has to act and direct, and that can kind of be tough, especially on a big Marvel movie. So I feel like they kind of just had to get him out of there, um, which is, it's fine, but... I, I wish I wish we had like real Korg back, but it, it it's fine. Uh, the CGI is on point in this movie. Um, in Multiverse of Madness, it, it it wasn't bad by any means. No Marvel CGI is bad. I've been hearing that the VFX artists on Marvel movies are just met with impossible deadlines, and I can see how why some of it just looks a little bit unfinished. Um, but there weren't. Hold on, I have a question right there, Cam. You you found this movie lo- looking visually unfinished? No, 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 not this movie, no. I, I've, I People have said other Marvel movies, especially recently, have looked uh, unfinished with the VFX. Um, Interesting. People... The last several I have seen, I just find them visually stunning. It's the reason to see them on the big screen, and this one in particular. Um, but there I are just... some scenes where the CGI, you can totally... It, it kind of breaks you out of the movie, and it, it obviously could just be me and a bunch of other overanalyzers doing our overanalyzing. 
and we could easily just be being overcritical, but you can look at the uh, No Way Home train fight between Doctor Strange and Spider-Man and can easily point out just the CGI is not on its peak there. But other than that, that movie had great uh, great visual effects. Uh, Multiverse of Madness had some iffy CGI, um, and I think that's mostly uh, visible in the TV shows, which don't look great. I guess th- from this my movie end, is I didn't have, I had, there were no visual weaknesses to either of those films. And I can be picky when I'm watching them. So I'd have to be coming in to look, looking for CGI weakness, I think, to spot that. Well, I'll tell you, I didn't, I didn't pay attention to that. I didn't really focus on that on my first watch of the movie at all. Um, that That's why I feel like I have to go in for a second watch of these Marvel movies, because... Uh, I find CGI details that are like, oh, that just doesn't look great, or uh, weird line delivery. Like, oh, that sounded really weird. Um, that's why I think it's always nice to have a second watch on the big screen. But, um, yeah, I thought this movie was one of the... had some of the best visual effects in a Marvel project in a while. I feel like WandaVision looked great, Loki looked great, Falcon Winter Soldier looked great, and this movie looked great. Um, the TV shows. I I, I, wanna, I might have to do a whole episode on the TV shows. There are a lot of things I want to talk about with that. Um, but moving on from that, uh, from CGI, and Darcy was in this movie. Uh, she wasn't in a lot, but it's good to know that she's still a character in the MCU after seeing her in WandaVision. Really um, nice uh, she. She's a great, funny character. And she kind of annoyed me in the earlier Thor films, but after seeing her in WandaVision, I love her. Um, she's fantastic. She's one of my faves. Yeah. Um, Gore, uh, was fantastic. He was, he might be one of my favorite Marvel villains. Actually, I feel like, um, he just needed more screen time. Other than that, he was perfect. Christian Bale, phenomenal performance. Um, just fantastic. You know, let me give you my take on, on Gore. You know, even if I think, you know, he was great at the start, and then great at the end. Like, take a look at Moon Knight. Like, you have um, a great villain in Arthur Harrow, and Ethan Hawke does a great job playing him. But my enjoyment of the villain is taken down um, a bit because I don't enjoy the show as much. So as much as I enjoyed Gore, I wouldn't put him above um, other Marvel villains because of my issues in parts of the film that weren't the beginning or the end. Yeah, I totally get that. And Moon Knight wasn't a great show, but I, I thought Arthur Harrow was fantastic. And I totally see what you mean there. Um, let's see here. I thought I thought um, Jane and Valkyrie actually did more screen time together, which we kind of touched on. Because um, they kind of had some stuff. Because... Um, I think Valkyrie had s- said that she had talked to Jane before. Correct me if well, I'm wrong. I saw something. Yeah, like well, like the scene where Valkyrie says that Jane's, and this is about what I'm saying about character development. The scene where Valkyrie says that Jane's catch catchphrases need work. That's implying that she's heard Jane say other catchphrases in the past, but we didn't actually see that in the film and i would have liked to see more of that and as you're saying cam more character development between those two yeah that would have really been nice um let's see here i wish thor and jane had just once again extra 25 minutes would have fixed all of my problems with this movie actually um i wish they just had more screen time together it, it I, was, I agree with that. I would have liked, you know, th- there's the movie that I want to see and then there's the movie that I saw. And the movie, what I saw is I tried to rate it for what it is. What I have loved more of an uh, exploration of Thor and Jane and really kind of to have seen Thor's pain at first being reunited with Jane and what was happening. And they did play it for laughs, which, which I'm okay with, but I really would have been engrossed if they didn't necessarily play it that way. However, that's a different movie and, and a different vision. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. It was great to have Natalie Portman back in that role. 
and with some of the pieces that we see towards the end of whether her character is going to continue in the future. Yeah, so on that end credit scene, I actually have a few things I want to say, but I'm going to wait till our part two to start to talk about that. Um, the character of Valkyrie in this movie, um, I thought she grew a lot as a character for me. I feel like she she kind of found her place as well. I feel like she really... I mean, I, I wish she was in the final uh, fight scene, but... I'll I'll take what I can get, and she, she she was great. I thought she was funny. Um, Tessa Thompson's just a great. She's just good at acting. I mean, in Creed, she's phenomenal. So I I, I really enjoyed her in this movie. If, if, answer me this, um, Cam. Do you think they might have moved away from having Valkyrie in the final fight scene so they could just kind of focus on Thor and Jane and their relationship without having her or Korg get in the way? Uh, I think so. Because, especially if they had Korg in that final fight scene, that would have messed it up a little bit for me. Because um, Korg's just too hilarious. <laughs> so, uh, I that... actually think Valkyrie could carry her own film. I think she, 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 she that's that a, strong... Now, that's a Marvel TV show I would watch, or a Marvel movie I would watch. Um, I, I actually want to talk about, um, while well, we're on the topic of Marvel TV shows, uh, <laughs> this doesn't have much to do with Love and Thunder, but people are saying that um, Marvel needs to focus on quality over quantity, and they're making too many TV shows. I mean, that's a fair point. But, you know, even though I haven't enjoyed Marvel's TV shows um, so far this year, um, I think that, like, if all the TV shows or or the ones coming out right now were good, like WandaVision, Loki, Hawkeye, that maybe people wouldn't have as much of an issue with them coming out with too many TV shows. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, but that's... We just got sidetracked. Um, but... but I think you're, you're, you're hitting on something there, Kim. So you're talking about the amount of shows that they were putting into, into production. And sometimes when, and how many Marvel films are we at now? 30? I believe many? 29. So if they've made 29 movies, it's really, the, the success rate that they've had with those 29 I think is really strong. I think they're, you know, in the last four or five or since the Infinity Saga came to a close, I think these movies are being judged almost too critically because you, if you just saw them on their own, um, and I'll go back to the Eternals. I, I think the Eternals was so missed by so many of the audiences because they had a different form of expectations. But you take that movie unto itself, I still think it's an exhilarating film. I feel like um, people do that about Multiverse of Madness as well. If you view it as its own movie, if you view it as like a as as a Sam Raimi movie, then you can maybe enjoy it more. <laughs> Either way, I enjoyed that movie. So I think well, it's an all time great Marvel film. I have it in my top five. Multiverse of Madness. Oh yeah, I thought it did so many great things. I thought the I think it was um, set up by the expectations of audiences to have different cameos kind of really dampened what actually was the great storyline and the character arc of, um, you know, Wanda throughout the film. I, I was engrossed. Yeah, just a fantastic movie right there. All right, so we're going to be right back with the part two. And yeah, we'll be right back and we're going to have more details for you. We're going to go into really big details here we're gonna we can talk about that whole scene with zeus that whole big storyline that we haven't really touched on um i can talk about the ending and credit scenes so check back in listen to this episode and then check out part two we'll see you in a few guys <laughs> 